Hey team, Sean Haverson here. We're going to talk about the central nervous system and we're going to explore the neurons and start at the microscopic level, then progressing through to gross brain anatomy and also including the spinal cord anatomy as well. Along the way, we'll probably talk about a few diseases that are relevant to the subjects we're discussing. In addition to the learning modules, lesson objectives that you had, we're going to need some preparation for this as well. So this is going to be building upon some of the things you've already learned in my other classes on electrolytes, cell membrane permeability, how things move in and out of cells, and then the major divisions of the brain. When you see this logo in the slides, that'll prompt you to look at the assigned lesson work that we have in Complete Anatomy. That lesson work is going to explore topics as we progress, and they're in the order uh, the lessons are in Complete Anatomy are going to be in the order that this slideshow is in. So you can follow along with that. Um, I'd recommend if you're able to, if you have the equipment for it, then you may want to consider having the lecture playing on your phone or uh, a desktop or laptop, and then integrating the uh, complete anatomy app on your iPad to follow along with. But either way, if you have to pause and switch between, you'll you'll be basically covered either way. Okay, so this is a list of the terms and concepts that we're going to review. Um, the terms and concepts will also have terms in them that we'll be using as vocabulary terms. So look for that in the module as well. Uh, there's a vocabulary list, um, and these terms will all be integrated into the lecture in some way. We've also got some more terms here that you can look at. Feel free to pause and review these as you need to. Okay, so let's get started with the functions of the nervous system. So we're going to dive into the structure of individual neurons here in a moment. But the overall function of the nervous system, including central and peripheral, includes the ability to monitor and then respond to some of the, the things that are going on inside of our body. It's monitoring the internal environment and it's monitoring the external environment with our senses as well. And when it responds, it generally responds by causing us to have some active process. Maybe it's a thought, maybe it's a, an actual physical uh, movement through motor control, or perhaps it's an organ doing something that we don't notice in the background um, and is out of our control. This is the major organization of the nervous system. So what we're talking about today is limited to the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system will be another lecture. And we have to split these two things uh, apart because the lectures would be really long and take up a lot of your time if we left it all for one module. So in order for you to digest it and to prepare you for emergency medicine, we separated these into the brain and spinal cord section, which we'll be exploring in this set of lectures. And the next set of lectures will be the peripheral nervous system. Now, the peripheral nervous system is going to include the autonomic, and that will have the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems in it. And that's essentially where the meat and potatoes of what we do is located. A lot of the medications that we'll use in emergency medicine are going to activate or manipulate in some way the parasympathetic or the sympathetic nervous system so that we can get the benefit of making it work basically in hyperdrive. And many diseases are based on these as well. You can explore the overall structure between the uh, central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system in the 3D Complete Anatomy app. And why don't we just actually take a look at that real quick. Okay, this is the Complete Anatomy app. And so we can see here, this will probably be one of your um, largest, I think, list of topics that we'll be exploring. So on the left hand side we've got a number of the topics and again they're going to go in the order that I've um, selected them to play along with the slides and in the slides you notice that we've got basically the M3.1 so for module 3.1 um, this is going to be the first uh, screen is what they're really called. So you can manipulate the screens. You can't get 
full functionality in these screens because they're essentially guided for you. But you can always just go to the model section of the app and you can explore the structures on your own and um, manipulate things as well. So what we're seeing here in this picture is the central nervous system is going to be located incorporating the brain and the spinal cord. So in this picture, it's all in gray. And then the peripheral nervous system are all the nerves that are attached to the spinal cord and communicate with the rest of the body back and forth. Okay, so the nervous system is broken into two different major structures when we're looking at the microscopic level. So we have cells that are going to be doing the actual work, and that's conducting nerve impulses between groups of nerves to result in things like movement, thought, uh, emotions, the whole spread. Then there's also support cells that we'll be integrating with as well, and the support cells have a very specific name. Those are called the glia. So let's take a look at some of these cells. Here we can see that we've got the brain cells outlined here, and <clears throat> on our key, the neurons are the only nerve-conducting actual cells in the nervous system. So neurons in green here are the nerve-conducting electrical impulse generating cells. Everything else, the astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, and, and our capillary cells. Now the astrocytes have their name because they have a, a characteristic that makes them look like a star. So that's where the astro comes from. And they are anchoring between our actual cells, the cell body of the neurons, and blood vessels. That's going to hold these things in proximity so that they can get the electrolytes and the basic components of energy that they need so that the nerve cells can do their work. Now the oligodendrocytes, and that's always a fun word to say, oligodendrocyte, the oligodendrocytes are responsible for maintaining, building, and tearing down the um, myelin sheaths that are around some of the axons of some of the cells in the body. Now if they're not working effectively, then we end up with actually some pretty severe diseases that we'll talk about later. So glial cells, glial cells are going to be the cells that support the nervous cell, and then the neurons are the actual conducting cells. This is the basic cell structure of a neuron. Now, you can see that most of the stuff that we would expect to see in really any nerves or any cell uh, at all are actually present here in the cell body. So some terms that we want to start getting familiar with. So the cell body, the cell body's term uh, is soma. So the soma is referring to just the cell body. And what we want to put into place is just kind of imagining the flow of electrical impulses. So these structures around through here that look like roots almost, these are going to be our dendrites. The dendrites are responsible for receiving signals. The axon, we can see generally there's this long axon. This is going to be the sending away from the cell body, sending the signal to another cell. It could be another neuron cell, it could be a muscle cell, whatever it is that it's integrating with. And so the general flow of electricity is going to come from the dendrites to the cell body and then along the axon until it gets to our um, receiving cell. And that receiving cell, if it's a neuron, is actually going to be con connected to the axon by having more dendrites connect to the axon. So the axon will communicate with the dendrites and then send the electrical impulse downrange on that cell as well. Okay, so some of the structures inside the cell, the organelles that we would learn about cells in general, uh, are still present. So we have the Golgi apparatus here. The Golgi apparatus is responsible for what in most cells? Take, take the guess. Think back to the cell section and your biology class as well. All right, so the cell is going to use the Golgi apparatus as its shipping and receiving center. And generally, it's going to take the components that were made by, say, our endoplasmic reticulum, um, smooth and rough, and it's going to take those components that were created through that process, package them into vesicles, and then they'll transport through the body. And of course, cells do a lot of work, especially nerve cells. And so we have mitochondria inside the cell to convert cellular components of energy into actual energy so we can do work. And the energy that we're talking about from metabolism is going to be ATP. That's going to be important for the nerve cell here that's going to be doing work. We'll talk about that just a little bit in a moment. The nucleus, the cell has a nucleus just like we would expect, and that's where the the just book of life essentially is. There's genetic coding there that can help tell the rest of the cell what it needs to do, and it has pages, you could say, within it that describe, say, 
something like repairing the plasma membrane as needed and things like that. The axon hillock is not something that we refer to in most cells, and so this is very specific to nerve cells. And so we have the connection of the axon and the soma, the cell body, right here, and you can see that this is kind of like a narrowing of that extension. That's going to be important when we talk about nerve cell um, conduction, especially in something called saltatory, saltatory conduction. Saltatory conduction is, uh, has nothing to do with salt. Um, salt is used in the nerve cell, but it's used in all conduction, not just saltatory conduction. Saltatory conduction, we'll explore in just a minute, but it basically outlines the conduction that happens in an axon that has additional protective cells on top of it that those oligodendrocytes were going to be maintaining. And these are called myelin cells and they have some ner they have some specific terms depending on where in the body uh, we see that cell but it's basically some insulation so saltatory conduction is a means of conducting when we have insulation on the axon we'll talk more about that in a few minutes another picture of the neuron structure so this is actually showing better than me just drawing it um, this is showing a picture that has our myelinated cell covering on it and in this case it's the swan cell the Schwann cell and the Schwann cells are actual cells that are by themselves basically independent and they circle around the axon so we can see the axon zoomed in here with the cell membrane in blue and then the yellow tan color here is highlighting the myelin sheath that makes up the Schwann cell the nodes of Ranvier are basically here where our Schwann cells leave a little gap from one to the next and that gap is important because that's actual where saltatory conduction will occur uh, not labeled here but this is basically where our axon hillux is, is. And this picture on the side is highlighting a cell body um, that does have uh, associated Schwann cells. Okay, zooming back in here, we've got our axon. We have the cell membrane. Now in this color, it's yellow. Uh, that's the cell membrane of the axon, and this is the myelin sheath around it. So a term that's added to this is the neurolemma. The neurolemma is the outer sheath of the Schwann cell, and the innermost is going to be our myelin sheath. And then we've got the nodes of Ranvier in between. And notice we've got a nucleus here. It's highlighting the nucleus, so it is its own independent cell um, that's surrounding the individual axons. Okay, on this slide we've got some stuff drawn out. Um, we're going to basically start off by zooming way into the neuron. And we're looking at, at a um, subcellular level in some ways. So what I've drawn here, and I really encourage you to draw as well, um, I've got a little bit of a key outlined. So <clears throat> in my drawing, the green triangles are going to be our sodium. And sodium are cations they have a positive charge remember cation uh, just as a reminder we'll write that down here cation there's our big plus right cations have positive charges and then this is I'll draw in purple in just a moment is going to be our potassium so what is the charge of potassium is it a cation or is it an anion and meaning without uh, charge meaning it's negative well, it's actually also a cation, and they both have a positive charge. Each of these struck each of these molecules have a positive charge of one. Now, this is actually where we're going to give rise to the idea that we have a difference in charges. One of the terms that we're going to be working on learning um, is going to have to do with polarization. So let's just start kind of defining this polarity in just a moment. Okay, so the other thing that we should be aware of <clears throat> on this screen as we're getting ready to draw out the process of polarization and depolarization is how we're measuring um, the electrical impulse that's generated. So a really fascinating thing is happening here. Inside the cell of our body, we and many uh, animals and organisms out there, we create electrical charges by using chemicals. So chemicals can give rise to electrical charges if certain conditions are in place. The first condition has to be that those generally those chemicals have to be an ion. And an ion means that it doesn't have a net zero charge. 
it's a little bit unstable in that state because if it's a positive charged ion, a cation, for example, then that means that that molecule is missing an electrical charge, which gave it a positive charge because the positive charge inside of the uh, molecule or atom's nucleus has more protons and neutrons than it does electrons. That means that it's got a positive charge and it wants to uh, interact with an anion that has a similar charge. So if we have an anion, like both of these um, ions, sodium and potassium, they're going to be generally placed into a salt or an electrolyte when they're combined with chloride. You've certainly heard of that, especially if you've um, worked in medicine before. So if we were talking about a, a, a salt ion that had sodium in it, then it would be something along the lines of sodium chloride. The chloride ion is a negative one charge and the sodium ion is a positive one charge. So the two of these come together and one positive one negative is a charge of zero. So this is a stable electrolyte right here. It's a salt meaning it has two electrolytes brought together um, and so in this position it's not doing a whole lot of work. But once we take the chloride and remove it uh, and get that out of there. Now we're back to having sodium with its positive one ionic state. Now that positive charge is going to result in electricity um, as we interact with the environment. So <clears throat> we're gonna be measuring that electricity as we go. So let's remember why we're learning this. We're learning this so we can understand the function of nerve cells in the body. And in emergency medicine, there's a few reasons for this, but the most practical will probably be interacting with medications and interacting with diseases. And so we don't generally measure elect uh, electrical depolarization in the brain. We do so of the heart, but not of the brain usually. That can be done in the hospital. And when we're trying to determine how we are gonna use <clears throat> this property in kind of a hack for our treatment in emergency medicine, one of the things that'll happen is if we can block some of these charges, then we may block the depolarization. That's extremely helpful if we're trying to numb pain, for example. Pain signals are electrical impulses through neurons that are going towards the brain, and those pain signals are going to elicit a response in the brain that we perceive as some type of pain, and there's lots of different types of pain out there. So if we stop the electrical impulse from occurring by stopping the chemical structures that are occurring, then we can numb that area. So anesthesia, especially um, anesthetizing wounds, for example, before we suture them, might be a means of uh, utilizing this knowledge. There's drugs out there that we can use for neurons that will impact the movement of these electrolytes. There's also drugs that we will use very similarly um, to change the depolarization of muscle cells. That might be something like RSI, rapid sequence induction, so we can intubate a patient who's otherwise awake. And if we needed to do something with the heart, uh, we can manipulate the heart by changing this depolarization because it all works very similarly. We're learning this specifically because it's the first and the simplest type of depolarization that we have in our body as an example. And we're going to build upon this model so that later we can understand the more complex model that's in the heart. And that gives rise to the EKG. So <clears throat> this isn't going to look anything like an EKG, but it's a similar principle. So down here I've got drawn for us um, a what would be displayed as a graph on a voltmeter, essentially. And our y-axis going up and down is going to be millivolts, and our x-axis is going to be time. I'm not looking for your knowledge of specific numbers here. It's the concept of positive and negative that we have. So up on the y-axis above this zero point is going to be positive charge, and down on the y-axis below the zero is a negative charge. And then time is generally measured in milliseconds, but we're just looking at it occurring over time. So we're going to need to show something occurring on this screen physically along the cell, and then we're going to pair that with what's happening down here on our graph representation. So let's get started. So the first part of all of this is understanding the idea of action potential. Action potential is the potential for a cell to do some type of work. So that means that it's primed and ready to do something, but it's not doing work just yet. And so we also need to contrast that with the idea that we have uh, our body tries to get to a point of equilibrium. So if we have imbalances on one side of a membrane versus the other side of the membrane, and things can cross that membrane, then the body's natural state is basically to try and get things equal equalized or reach equilibrium on both sides of the membrane. This is the cell's plasma membrane right here. 
the cell's plasma membrane that we're looking at, we basically cut the axon in half. And so the soma is here, and we would be looking at electrical impulses going downrange from left to right towards the axon terminal where it communicates with the next cell. Follow me on that? If not, go back a few slides and you can see the actual cell and you will see the thing that we're zooming into. Now I basically cut it in half when we're looking at a cross section uh, of the axon. So the environments that we're going to start with are going to be in the action potential. The action potential is the opposite of equilibrium because what we're trying to do is build something that's imbalanced and then when the body is going to try to balance things, that's when we get the movement of electricity and chemicals that will give us an action. And you'll see more of what I mean in just a moment, so bear with me. Okay, so in showing us an action potential. An action potential is an imbalance. Zero is balanced. So with an action potential, we're measuring the inside, inside, so this is the intracellular environment. With an action potential, we're starting off in action potentials below zero. So the inside of this cell is more negative than the outside of the cell. The outside of the cell relative to the inside is more positive. So this is intracellular space, and this is the interstitial space, or the third space, between cells. That's what our cells are bathed, bathed in. So <clears throat> earlier on in the first lectures of the class, we learned something along the lines of major intracellular and extracellular cations. So let's define those as a reminder. Our major intracellular cation. So remember, a cation has a positive charge. Our major intracellular cation is different from our major extracellular, and I'll just write the extracellular down here, major extracellular cation. Okay, so let's define those. Major intracellular cation is going to be, we should probably change our colors here so we can get proper representation. Our major intracellular cation is going to be potassium. Potassium likes to live on the inside of the cells, and if you're an intermediate, you already know this, given your knowledge of potassium uh, solutions. So potassium's a pretty devastating and dangerous electrolyte if it's in the wrong area. Sodium isn't as dangerous in small concentrations as potassium is in small concentrations. They can certainly cause problems if they're both out of balance. But potassium is our major intracellular cation. So that means that on the inside of the cell, potassium is more abundant than the uh, sodium that's on the inside of the cell. Likewise, our major extracellular cation is going to be sodium. So most cells that we're talking about in the body, specifically for neurons, but most cells in the body also follow this as well. So our skeletal muscle cells and the cell of the cardiac muscle will also have the same um, principles and properties. Okay, so to get this representation, let's first start with sodium. So we have a bunch of sodium floating around, and in our case, the sodium is going to be a triangle. On the outside of the cell, remember this is our action potential state. We're not doing anything yet, but we're not at equilibrium either. And that's happening on both the, the bo like basically 360 degrees, although I've got top and bottom here, that's not accurate. In 360 degrees around the cell, we have outside of the cell in the extracellular or interstitial space, we have a bunch of sodium floating around. On the inside of the cell, on the inside of the cell, we have a bunch of potassium. And truly, there's probably some sodium on the inside of the cell and some potassium on the outside of the cell to make this, you know, realistic. But for our purposes, we're just going to kind of limit them to their, their major environment at each time. Okay? So what I've drawn here is essentially the action potential state of the inside and outside of the cell. But remember, down here, we're only measuring the inside of the cell. So this line below zero, this flat line before and after the graph we're going to build is our action potential. Okay, action potential. So that means that we have more sodium on the outside of the cell than potassium on the inside of the cell. Okay, now one of the things we're going to have to highlight is how do we get positive and negative if both of the things we're talking about 
are positive, right? Potassium has a positive charge and sodium has a positive charge. Well, because we have more of one on the outside than the other, if we say have three on the outside and two, three sodium on the outside and two potassium on the inside, then that would give us a difference of a net charge of one, right? So if I have three positively charged sodium on the outside, that means basically three positive charges and two potassium on the inside, that's two positive charges, then the outside of the cell is more positive and the inside of the cell is more negative. Does that make sense? Well, I'll just draw it so we can have it. So we've got uh, two potassium on the inside of the cell, three sodium on the outside of the cell. So it's more positively charged out here than it is in here, although both are positive. Okay. So what happens in this process is we have an imbalance. If it was equilibrium, we'd have three on the outside and three on the inside or um, some other a combination of similar positive charges on both sides of the membrane. But that's not what happens in the action potential. Remember, we need an imbalance for stuff to try and reach equilibrium without using a lot of energy. So equilibrium is going to be sought by these cells by their natural state. So that's without a lot of expended energy. But to build the action potential, we're kind of working against it. So here's another analogy. Let's say that I've got <clears throat> um, a hill, right? I've got a hill and on the other side of the hill, I have a body of water. But my house is way up here. How am I going to get water so that I can eat, drink, shower, use the bathroom way up here if there's no water, but all the water is down here? Well, if water, if it's raining, for example, water is going to start to go down the hill by gravity, right? Water goes down the hill by gravity without any energy. We don't have to, it doesn't have to expend energy, it doesn't have to use gas, it doesn't have to use electricity. It just rolls down using gravity. But if I needed to get water now back up the opposite direction of the natural flow, what am I going to have to use? Now, firefighters in the audience should be able to answer this pretty easily. It's a pump. And pumps expend energy. Maybe it's an electric pump. You plug into the wall, you use electricity. It's a gasoline pump, kerosene pump, uh, or it's a pump like in our body where it uses cellular energy to do things. Well, that's exactly what we're looking towards. These triangle structures are going to be our sodium potassium pumps. So a pump means that it's working against the natural process. Okay, And these structures here, these are going to be our voltage gated ion channels. And voltage-gated ion channels are basically just pores that are um, made primarily up of proteins, and these pores are going to be open or closed. If they're open, then they allow the stuff on either side of the membrane to try and reach equilibrium. If they're closed, then nothing will move anywhere unless we use some other means. And so the pump that we're using here is going to be going against the grain right? So if we have a whole bunch of positive charges on the outside of the cell versus the inside of the cell and the channels are open, then we're going to have stuff rush into the cell to make that equilibrium. If it's closed, stuff can't move without energy and we want to move now from say positive one and positive one, we want to change that charge, we have to pump something in the opposite direction. So in our cases, we're going to be pumping sodium from the inside out and potassium from the outside in as we change our states. Again, roll with me. It'll make a lot more sense after I explain it and put the pieces together. Okay, so the way our sodium potassium pumps work is they're going to pump three sodium. So that's why we have that triangular shape to every two potassium, okay? And the pump is gonna expend energy. It's gonna be the form of cellular energy, which is ATP. So ATP is gonna lose a phosphate ion and convert to ADP. Uh, reminder, what does ATP stand for? Think back to our cell lecture. Great, adenosine triphosphate, the T is for tri. Now, if we lose one phosphate group, which is basically cellular energy, then now we go from three phosphates to two adenosine diphosphate. Now, we do this in order to make the pump action work. So when this is occurring, we're basically pumping stuff in and out of the cell. If we want stuff to get pumped in and out of the cell against the grain, then we also have to close our ion channels. 
Okay. okay, so we're at a point where our ion channels have all closed and the pumps are working, pumping three to one, three to two ratio. So again, that means that when three sodium are pumped out, two potassium go in. So there's a negative charge now because there's more positive charged ions on the outside of the cell than there are positive charged ions in the form of potassium on the inside of the cell. So that's how we got to our action potential. We're going to look at that again. Now, again, remember, this is going to occur basically in a... a stepwise chronological process from the soma all the way down to the axon terminal. So this is the direction our charges are going to be occurring. Okay, so right now we have a change in polarity, and polarity basically is talking about something that has polar opposites. If you're thinking about magnets, and electricity is very similar, if you're thinking about magnets, then the polar opposite is going to be that thing that repels and flips magnets around. So when we're talking about electricity, we can have polar opposites by a positive and negative, and that's exactly what we have here. If we don't have polarity, then we have equilibrium. So since we have polar opposites, we can depolarize which means we go from polarity to no polarity, so we're now going towards the equilibrium state, and we can repolarize, go from the equilibrium state back towards polarity. And we're starting with our action potential. So right now we have polarity, right? And we know that because the inside of the cell is not zero charge, it's a negative charge. And we got that again by having three sodium pumped out of the cell and two potassium pumped in the cell with a positive charge out on the outside of the cell versus a more negative negative charge on the inside of the cell. It's all relative. All right, so we start by uh, with this process. Everything's been pumped out. The channels are all closed right now. So it, the cell is just waiting for a signal to depolarize, okay? So <clears throat> let's say that the dendrites of this uh, axon, I'm sorry, the dendrites of this neuron have received an electrical signal. That electrical signal is going to make its way down, and it kind of builds up as we get here close to the axon hillock. Now what's going to happen is we have these voltage-gated ion channels, and right now they're closed. And when I say voltage-gated, that means that we have a little protein structure attached to these channels. And again, the channel's right now closed. And in order to open the gate, voltage-gated, we have to have a certain threshold of electrical charge occur. So what that, ha what that means is right now it's at a negative charge, so it's closed. Once this charge becomes positive right next to it, then the voltage-gated ion channel will open up and allow us to uh, flow potassium out of the cell and sodium in the cell. Okay, so that electrical impulse, we were at our actin potential, which means inside the cell is negative. The electrical impulse that's coming from our uh, dendrites through the cell body and now to the axon hillock are going to cause this channel to open. And that will rush sodium into the cell. Okay, these channels will open and rush sodium into the cell. So now we've made a positive charge on the inside of the cell relative to a negative charge on the outside of the cell. We basically reverse polarity, right? We had this positive charge on the outside, negative on the inside. Then as the De the de <clears throat> depolarization occurs and electrical charges become more positive on the inside of the cell. Sodium rushes into the cell. Then we get a more positive charge on the inside of the cell and a more negative charge on the outside of the cell. We just depolarized. So if we look at that on our graph representation here, we should see the inside of the uh, cell, the intercellular environment, spike upwards, positive. It just crossed the zero mark, which means we're at a positive mark. So the cell does this very quickly. So when we see this on our graph, we're going to this is basically representing here this is depolarization. Depolarization is the reversing of polarity and that should be true, right? We went from negative to positive. Okay, so we reverse polarity and again that occurred by the charge next to this voltage-gated ion channel becoming more positive, causing the, ch the channel to open. And we built an imbalance, right? This is kind of like a, a dam. We just opened the gates of the dam because all the sodium wanted to get in the cell to reach equilibrium and now we've allowed it to do so. So while this is happening, we're depolarizing, this is going to occur by causing a little bit of a positive charge here, 
and that opens this channel, okay? Then the sodium rushes in. That makes the inside of this environment more positive, but it only does it in the area with, within the local channel that's open. So it doesn't spread all the way down the axon from one channel, but it is just enough that we meet the threshold of the voltage gate on this ion channel. So this becomes positive, now it opens, and sodium rushes into the cell. And we get a positive charge, so we've got our positive charge. We'll say that's reaching 360 degrees, so it reaches this voltage-gated ion channel, and sodium rushes in the cell in depolarization here. And this just happens block by block until the entire inside of the cell is more positive than the outside. That was the reverse of polarity, okay? So <clears throat> that occurring is what basically gives us the electrical signal going through the axon all the way down to the axon terminal. If this doesn't happen, then we won't have depolarization. Now, there's a, a catch here. We have to meet that certain amount of electrical charge for these channels to open. If we don't meet the electrical charge, the channel doesn't open, and the depolarization will stop right there because the channel remains closed. If we have depolarization all the way through up until this channel, then we won't have anything or action occur at the end because it doesn't reach the terminal where it releases the neurotransmitters that signal to the next cell, hey, do something to take action. So <clears throat> let's recap that by looking at a, a, a new presentation. Okay, <clears throat> so let's say that we're kind of in the middle of depolarization, okay? So these things kind of happen um, sequentially. Now we got to the point back down here on our um, graph, we've gotten to the point where we have depolarized, and that happened, let's just recap, let's draw it here, actually, that happened by, that happened by sodium rushing in, right, so we had enough of an electrical charge every so far in distance along the length and time along the length of this axon. We had enough electrical charge that right here we opened and stimulated the voltage-gated ion channel, and that caused sodium to rush into the cell. And that was possible because outside the cell we had an imbalance, we had an action potential. Outside the cell we had basically 3 to 2 ratio of sodium, more sodium on the outside of the cell than potassium on the inside of the cell, giving us a net charge of positive on the outside, negative on the inside. And so the, get, the gated channel closed held that stuff out. It wanted to get in the cell so bad, though, because it, it wants to reach equilibrium. And so once we open up these channels, then it just rushes in. We don't have to expend much energy in doing so. It just rushes in to its normal process, and then the inside of the cell will become more positive than the outside of the cell, or at least equivalent. Okay, so that's happening, and let's say that's continuing down this side over here, okay, towards the axon terminal. But on this side, we've already done that. So let's say the inside of the cell here is positive, positive, positive. The channel's opened and had already rushed in, all right? So we need to get ready for another one. If we don't change the environment, there could be no depolarization. So right now we're at equilibrium, so we're basically approaching zero. If we don't have an imbalance, then there won't be an action potential. So our goal is to, at the end of this cycle, get back down here to our action potential, which is a solid state below zero. Okay, So I've got all this sodium now on the inside of this cell. Okay, That just happened. We literally just went up on this spike, and you see it doesn't take much time at all. Oh, we left, uh, we left out a letter here. We just depolarized, right? depolarization. So we've got all this sodium on the inside of the cell. What happens now is we have a few different channels. We have channels that are sodium channels, and we have channels that are potassium channels. So as we do this, some of the sodium is going to remain in the cell momentarily. As the sodium is in here, it's going to push out some of the potassium. Okay, So the potassium moves its way out of the cell through its own channels, and now we've got potassium in the <clears throat> excuse me, the interstitial or extracellular environment. And that's happening in 360 degrees, remember, all the way around because this is a, a, a cross-section. So <clears throat> these channels aren't fast necessarily. They're leaky, so stuff passively goes through them. Remember, we have a lot of potassium on the inside of the cell, but not outside. So it's only natural that if the channel's open, it's going to try to reach equilibrium as well, and the potassium makes its way out of the cell. So as that happens, we end up with this we end up with this downward stroke. And again, we've got to get back to zero, that's equilibrium, and below zero by actions of a pump. 
So as we start to go down this graph towards the zero mark, what's happening is the potassium channels are starting to leak across these membranes and the sodium channels begin to close. And the sodium channels closing now means that sodium is actually trapped inside the cell and it's not going to get out unless we pump it out. So we have to return to, this is just depolarized, so the inside's more positive right now. Uh, Maybe almost equal, but we're, we're more positive on the inside of the cell than the outside for a while, and then we will reach equilibrium. Okay, so this is going to be a state where we're not polarized anymore, and we don't have an action potential. So we have to go from depolarization to repolarize. So repolarization is basically resetting everything. It's getting our polarity back. If we reach equilibrium, there is no polarity. So we want to have a, an environment again in which the sodium is on the outside of the cell and potassium is on the inside of the cell. And that's when our sodium potassium pump works. Okay. So sodium potassium pump gets us back to zero and below zero. So as we're doing so, we'll get closer and closer to the action potential. We can't have any depolarization occur when we're above or below at the level of zero. We have to be below the level of zero for another depolarization to occur. And basically, this is occurring so we can have another signal sent through. If it stays with one depolarization and doesn't reset itself, then we can't have another set of work uh, occur yet. So <clears throat> as we have down here, the electrical impulses causing a depolarization going down. As soon as these have depolarized, they start to repolarize. So in the same direction, we're going to have repolarization occur. And that's going to be through the use of the sodium potassium pump. So it's going to take the sodium and take it out of the cell while I get three sodium out of the cell with a charge of three net. With our potassium then going back into the cell, and that gives us our change. And it's going to take some time before we actually get to that point. But it's always pumping at 3 sodium to 2 potassium into the cell. Okay, so I've gotten rid of uh, our potassium and sodium from the uh, opposite side. So now we have, let's say that over time, we've gotten most of the sodium out of the cell and most of the potassium into the cell. So that's occurred. So back here, we're back to a state where we've got a positive charge on the outside of the cell and negative charge on the inside of the cell. These channels are closed, our potassium channels are closed, and the pump is pumping the sodium in and out of the cell. Okay, so <clears throat> along the graph, we could see here that we have an area of repolarization that's above the level of zero and an area below the level of zero. Okay, so this is important to know because we can get to a point where we just have enough um, polarity or we have enough action potential that if there's a discharge, meaning there's a, a, another signal that's originating up here in the dendrites through the body, and trying to get to the discharge all the way through at the end of the axon, then we just need to have enough of a state here where just the smallest amount of electricity that meets the threshold will open it up. And if that occurs, we still haven't finished pumping sodium out or potassium since we're not below zero or very far below zero. So when this occurs, we can have a refractory period. So let's kind of define that a bit here. So re for repolarization, we're going to have an refractory, refractory period. So we have an absolute refractory and we have a relative refractory period, okay? So these are two different stages, and refractory means basically that nothing will happen. So an absolute refractory period is our period basically above zero, where we do have some of the sodium potassium moved across, and if there's an electrical impulse that happens while the cell is trying to get back to the state, then absolutely nothing will happen. There will be no depolarization because we haven't fully repolarized. Okay. Action potential is where we're going to get our best depolarization, the one that we just started with, the full amount of electricity that we need to send the electrical signal all the way through. The relative refractory period is going to be between the level of zero roughly down to the level of the action potential. And so if we have a depolarization, we have some sodium and some potassium in the right location, but not fully uh, polarized yet. So we can have a relative depolarization that's not full. It's relative to the amount of uh, 
chemical signatures we have in and out of the cell. So I'm going to use actually a little different analogy for this. So let me go to another page just for a moment. We'll come back to that uh, in just a second. But let's kind of start off with um, a toilet because, you know, that's what we all do. And maybe you're doing that right now while you watch this lecture. Apparently, I got a really big toilet. There we go. Okay. So let's say that uh, you and someone you just met are going on a date, right? And for whatever reason, I'm totally stealing this from TV, whatever reason you decide to take the significant person in your life to get something to eat, right? So you go to a restaurant and this restaurant serves Indian food, okay? Spicy, lots of flavors. I love Indian food, but I would not try it on a date. So you guys eat and you go back to this person's apartment and let's say that they have a, a nice studio apartment, right? And in the studio apartment, you know, the, the kind where, uh, well, why don't we just draw it out the floor plan here, right? Um, here's the bathroom. Maybe there's a closet here. Uh, this is where our toilet's located. This is the bathroom. And right here is the sofa and the TV set that you guys, that, that your other person is hanging out on. Okay. So you go to the bathroom and you sit down and man, you really got bubble guts, right? So I guess we could probably change this to a frown. Got some bubble guts. And so you say, excuse me, and you go to the bathroom, okay? Now, assuming that, let's just say this is an American toilet where we have the tank sitting directly on top of the bowl. Well, the way that the toilet works is we have the drain, obviously, that's going to be below the level of this tank. So inside the tank, stage state one, is full. So you go to the bathroom and you spackle the toilet, let's just be honest, and, you know, it's, it's pretty rough, so you don't want to uh, completely um, fumigate uh, your significant other, your date that's in here, and not on the first date anyways, you know, you wait until like the second or third date or you get married for that, but <clears throat> there you go, so you're going to probably just go for a courtesy flush, right? If I have a full tank, full tank of water, then when you courtesy flush, you'll wash the water out. Okay, and after you f just discharge all the water in this tank, it's no longer full, it's empty. If it's at the very bottom, it just started, you just flushed, and you're trying to get rid of it by flushing again, it hasn't had time to fill, will, will it flush? What kind of flush will you get? You'll get no flush, right? So if it's empty, no flush. And we can think of this as a state of polarity, right? Equilibrium would be an equal amount of water in here, equal amount of water in here. We, we're not generally seeking for that. So right after you flush, you take the full amount of water and you send it down. So we went from basically a state of polarization and we depolarize. We let the water rush out and then it's empty here, empty here, and now we got to start filling again. Well, let's say that now you've let it go by some time and we have half the tank full. Okay, so we get one half tank. One over two is 0 0.5. That's awkward. Thank you, Siri. So you have half a tank. If you have half a tank in the toilet and you flush, what will you get? you'll get half a flush, right? It's not the greatest flush, it's not a full flush, but something's moving, right? So these are basically like the evaluation we just had with the, elect with the uh, neuron. So <clears throat> we had our action potential where we're below the level of zero, polarity, we depolarize, more of a straight line, we depolarize and then, and then we repolarize, right? We get back to that polarity. We have our absolute refractory period in which nothing will happen. That's the empty tank here. And then we get somewhat there. We're halfway to the point of repolarization. If we try to, to repol if we try to depolarize here and have another signal, we'll get half a depolarization that occurs. Just like I got a half a tank, if I flush, I get half a flush out of it. So that's essentially the analogy that we'll use for uh, the repolarization and polarity states. So back to our slide here, as we repolarize through here, we're resetting by getting our potassium on the inside of the cell and our uh, sodium on the outside of the cell. And once we've done that, we're back at our action potential. 
If we have an action potential, that means that we have a more positive outside the cell than on the inside of the cell. And again, we're measuring the inside of the cell here. So it's a negative below zero charge. That's our action potential. We're ready to do work, but we haven't done any work. We receive a signal to depolarize. We cause our voltage-gated ion channels to open, and sodium first rushes in. So those are our fast voltage-gated sodium ion channels. And that brings us to go from a zero state reversing polarity to a very positive state. Okay. Once that occurs, we've got all the sodium basically rushing into the cell. So we're a positive charge. Now it kind of the pendulum swung the opposite direction essentially. And we're going to start making our way where potassium is leaking out of the cell and sodium's in the cell and the cell's trying to reach equilibrium. We close the sodium channels and eventually close the potassium channels, and that will stop fluid from going or the, the ions from going in and out of the cell. And now we get to a point where we want to repolarize. Repolarization is going to be done using the pump in which three sodium are pumped out of the cell, two potassium are pumped into the cell. That gives us that charge difference, the polarity, more positive on the outside because I have more positive charges and more negative on the inside relative to the outside because I have less positive charges. And once I reach that point, I'm at full repolarization at the action potential. But there is a place that exists in between. I have a refractory period where if I have not repolarized but the process has started, but it's very early, I'm not below zero yet, I will get a absolute refractory period in which nothing will happen. No depolarization will occur. We didn't meet the threshold for these channels to open electrically, so they don't open and nothing happens. That's it. It's just done till it gets through the process again. But if I wait a little while and I'm below zero, but not quite to our action potential, I'll get a relative period, relative refractory, which means that I do get a depolarization, but it might not be 100%. It might not be as strong. It may not in some cases, make it all the way through unless all of these channels are reaching the threshold at each channel to open based on the voltage. If I wait, though, I don't send a depolarization signal through until I've gotten my action potential, then I should have a full depolarization occur. And again, reminding us why we say polarity, depolarization, repolarization. We're using the term polarity, meaning we have kind of opposites, extreme opposites. So positive would be negative. That's the extreme opposite. So I have that change across the cell membrane. And the cell membrane, without the channels and without the pumps, wouldn't allow anything to go in and out uh, because the charged ions don't really play well with my phospholipid bilayer. Remember, that's occurring here as well. So the channel and the pump are my only means of going through the process. And remember, a pump is working against the natural grain. If I was using water up a hill, I'm going to have to use electricity, I'm going to have to use gas, I'm going to have to use some energy or fuel to make it work. Here, same thing happens. I have to have some energy or fuel for this to work. It's taking ATP and removing a phosphate ion through the process of each cycle of the pump to make ADP by losing a phosphate ion to the cell, uh, to the pump. Now, one other thing I didn't mention is now I've got three binding sites here for sodium, two binding sites for potassium. This cell can only change its shape and spit the potassium into the cell and spit the sodium out of the cell if all of these things are fully bound. It won't change if I only have two sodium. And that means that it protects that positive charge on the outside of the cell from ever being something other than, because without the three binding sites attached to sodium, it doesn't matter. This won't work. And likewise, without ATP, cellular energy from my mitochondria here, without ATP, this can't change its shape and it can't work as a pump either. So all of those things have to be true for this to work. Okay, so before we move on, um, and we're going to see some other forms of depolarization here in a moment, let's just go back to that graph that we had. Graph again here, uh, and just the graph at this time, and then we'll highlight the steps that are occurring for us to meet this. Okay, so remember on our y-axis we have millivolts, and on our x-axis we have time. And that's usually going to be the case when we look at this depolarization chart. Now, there are actual values for millivolts, depending on the cell that we're looking at in its depolarization, meaning that the voltage-gated ion channels have to meet a certain electrical charge value in millivolts for it to do anything, and that's where we actually get that uh, refractory period from. But for our purposes here, we're not actually memorizing that 
um, value. We just want to know polarity, positive versus negative charges, okay? So <clears throat> the, the phase we start off with in the beginning is phase zero, and that's going to be our action potential, as we recall. So that's our baseline. So there we go. We're going to draw it on both sides here. Okay, so uh, what we've got here is our um, graph representation that we're going to highlight. So again, we've got our y-axis and our x-axis. The x-axis is time, the y-axis is millivolts, and there is actually a millivolt charge, a number, a value, um, that will open these voltage-gated ion channels. We don't need to memorize that necessarily for our level. We just need to know the the idea of polarity, the positive and negative, okay? So what I'm going to draw is the, the graph here uh, along the chart as well. And then I'm going to label on this side. Uh, let's just get rid of that for a moment. I'm going to label on this side what's happening. Now, there's a, there's a caveat to this, okay? I'm taking a little bit of freedom in outlining this. This is not exactly the number of phases that the neuron goes through, but we're taking this eventually and expanding it to the skeletal muscle and then towards cardiac muscle in the end. And we will have to learn the individual phases for the cardiac muscle. You'll need that next semester in pharmacology. You'll need that later in the cardiology class. But right now, um, we're going to kind of leave an open area that we're going to insert the things that change between this graph and the cardiac graph later. So we're basically starting to memorize the cardiac graph now. It, it takes quite a bit of time, um, and it's extremely important at the way that we um, treat our patients and recognize what medications to use. Okay, so. <clears throat> what we're going to show is we start off with our baseline of action potential. So that's the first lines we have here. And so that's going to be uh, phase number four. So in this phase, we have our action potential. That means that the inside of the cell, again, that's what this graph is measuring, is more negative than the outside of the cell. And why was that? Well, in this state, we have sodium on the outside of the cell. And we have potassium on, oh, one positive charge there, on the inside of the cell. And we have that pumping action. So basically the representation is we have a three charge to every two charges of potassium. So more positive on the outside than inside the cell. So we're ready to do work. We have polarity. Yes? Okay. So remember the first thing that happens, this is going to be our phase zero. The first thing that's going to happen is our sodium channels are going to open and their more complex term is fast voltage-gated ion channels, that's going to open. And when that occurs, we have that big influx of sodium. We have that big influx of sodium that's going to cause this graph to go up, right? So it goes up almost a straight line, meaning that in very short time, sodium rushes into the cell. So sodium open, channels open, and sodium goes inside the cell, all right? Now, it does so until it gets to a, a peak point, and that peak point is basically the maximum amount of positive charge that's rushed in the, shell, the cell. So at this peak, we uh, reach the maximum amount of sodium going in the cell, and in a few milliseconds, the fast voltage-gated sodium channels are going to close. Well, as this is occurring, we also have our potassium channels um, are open, and the potassium channels basically going out, leaking out um, initially qu pretty quickly, but over time slowly. So potassium leaves the cell and goes outside the cell and has to be pumped back in. So as that occurs, we end up with this kind of, we end up with this kind of simple, slowly do towards our action potential um, pace. And again, the zero line is here, so until we get below the level of zero, we can't have another um, depolarization occur. So this is phase zero, sodium channels open, we reach our, our peak here. So <clears throat> what we have right now in this phase is uh, we'll have phase one at the, the height here, and phase one is going to be where we'll have a, a future thing occur, but for right now, potassium is out of the cell. Phase two, something else happens, but we'll save that for later. So right now, potassium's leaking out of the cell. So we have one and two for our purposes right now. It's potassium leaking out of the cell, and sodium channels are closed. 
So as sodium channels close, we can start working with our pump. So the sodium potassium pump is going to start working somewhere within this region here. And in phase three, we basically have slowing of the sodium channels going out and our sodium potassium pump is working to bring us back to polarity. Okay, so this occurs and we get to our relative refractory and absolute refractory periods here. So this isn't for action potential, this is going to be our refractory period. And remember, the refractory period is going to depend on what charge we have in the cell at that time. So if another electrical impulse comes in this area above, then we won't have a depolarization. If we have it here, but not quite here, then we have a relative, maybe the half flush analogy, a relative um, depolarization that occurs. So the order of things is we start off with our action potential. We have more sodium on the outside of the cell than potassium on the inside of the cell. So it's a net charge of positive outside, negative inside. Then we have fast voltage gated sodium channels open that causes massive depolarization. The sodium rushes in because we built so much of it on the outside of the cell. And then our potassium channels are opening and potassium kind of leaks in. Sodium channels eventually close and we get to a phase where we're now going below zero by using a pump. We're going against the grain. So the sodium potassium pump starts to work. This is where our active form of cellular transport is working and it's going to use AT ATP to do so and then we get back to our action potential and we're ready for it to happen again. Now we saw that happening along that that line of starting somewhere in this area going through the dendrite axon hill exemplifies that charge and then we continue down for our electrical depolarization and then we'll have neurotransmitters released if the electrical impulse made its way back to the axon terminal. On this picture, though, we're showing the uh, Schwann cells or myelinated sheath here, here, and in this case, we got a couple. And this is especially important. It's essentially um, a form of insulation, essentially really important if we're trying to communicate across a long axon. We have some axons that start in the central nervous system um, in the brain and then make their way all the way down to the cells that become uh, peripheral neurons as we exit the spinal cord, perhaps way down at the bottom of the spinal cord. So these axons can get really long. And that means that we have both distance and time to overcome if we want the signal originating here to be strong enough for that voltage gated channel to open all the way down the length of the plasma membrane until we get to these uh, axon terminals here. So what can happen with that is some type of insulation where we have an actual cell wrapped around and here we have a cross section around the axon. So what ends up occurring is because there's this physical barrier we don't really have sodium channels and pumps where we have our myelinated sheaths. They're all tucked into these little areas here. So that means that they have voltage gated ion channels here. We have to meet a threshold. So the axon hillock will amplify the electrical impulse. That will open channels here. That will strengthen as sodium rushes into the cell. That will strengthen the electrical charge. And then the electrical charge has to make its way in strength. It's going to dissipate over time and distance until it gets here. And it has to be the at least the amount that will open the channels here so that sodium will rush in the cell again here. So this is the process that we mentioned earlier called saltatory conduction. In some books, in some ways that this is described, it's kind of described as the nodes of Ranvier being these points here. We'll put those as nodes of Ranvier. It's described as electrical impulses jumping from nodes of Ranvier to node of Nan It doesn't happen that way on the outside of the cell. This is occurring inside the cell. So the channels open here at this node of Ranvier. That strengthens the electrical impulse that was weakening here as long as it met the threshold. That strengthens that charge back to its really strong charge. And that charge will then have to then have to make its way all the way down to open this channel. So it actually occurs inside the axon. That's the, the jumping, if you will, of electrical impulse, where it opens these channels again, and there's pumps over here, and it occurs until it gets to these channels, which will spark something occurring in the axon terminal. So that's essentially the process of saltatory conduction. And that occurs, remember, in cells that have myelinated sheaths around the axons. And we can actually visually see these things um, in the presence of white and gray matter. We'll get to that in just a moment. So let's use some definitions here. I'm going to give um, some 
numbers that will help us just understand the process, but I don't necessarily need you to memorize this. So when we have a nerve impulse, we have this, this propagation as listed of electrical influx of chemicals that have charges, electrical charges with them, that creates an electrical impulse opening more channels, physical structures throughout the axon, and sending electricity from the dendrite through the uh, cell body, the soma, down the axon to the axon terminal so it can communicate with whatever cell it's connected to. So when this is occurring, we get, um, especially in long distance cells, we get this property called saltatory conduction. When we have cells that are surrounded on the axon uh, with myelinated sheaths, which are actually cells by themselves. So that prevents the sodium potassium pump from operating because they physically block the, the inside of the cellular space from into integrating directly with the intracellular or, I'm sorry, extracellular or interstitial space uh, around it. So it can't access the uh, sodium channels that are on the outside uh, of that cell. So it has to do it at the nodes of Ranvier. So the conduction velocity is going to be increased and it's kind of like a, as I mentioned earlier, some type of insulation so that over distance and time we don't lose as much electricity as it makes its way down that that process so this is very efficient because it's not using as many um, sodium channels which means it doesn't use as much ATP and sodium pumps rather doesn't use as much ATP to get through okay so a nerve impulse is basically this idea of depolarization that takes a chemical with an ion charge, which is electrical, and turns it into an electrical charge that occurs starting at the dendrites, making its way through the soma, the cell body, down the axon to the axon terminal. Now, going from dendrite all the way through to the axon terminal is a nerve impulse that will send a signal to the cell that it's connected to. Maybe that's a muscle cell, which will be the example in our next set of lectures, our next chapter that we'll look at. Or it could be another, ax another um, nerve cell in which it, the axon is connected probably to dendrites. And that would give rise to nerve impulses, thoughts, memories, emotions, and all of those things that we'll talk about of the brain today. Now, the saltatory conduction is specifically in myelinated uh, axons in which the axon has myelinated sheaths around it. The myelinated sheaths are going to prevent the sodium-potassium pump from working, and it doesn't have a lot of uh, sodium channels for uh, sodium to rush in through. So that means that we have less sodium-potassium pumps along the length of that long axon, most likely is where it's located, and that means we need less energy in the form of ATP. So it makes it very efficient. So think of this as um, insulation. Myelinated sheath is an insulation around the axon, just like we might have insulation around a wire, and that makes it more efficient and increases the conduction velocity. Um, when we're looking at the, the velocity or the speed at which the nerve impulse electrical signal is occurring, in myelinated sheaths that have an, an axon with myelination or using saltatory conduction, we can increase from an unmyelinated velocity of 0.2 to 2 milliseconds to a speed of 12 to 120 milliseconds. So the rate of depolarization is extremely fast in these axons and gives rise to us communicating quickly with our hand to pull away from uh, something that we're worried about hurting us. We can do that really quickly from a nerve impulse from our brain and spinal cord. Okay, so now let's move on from the conduction of electricity to us sending neurotransmitters across a space between cells. Now these cells are really close together, but they're not right on top of each other. There is a little bit of space between the axon and the cell that's receiving the signal. Now for the examples I'm going to give here, to fit our purposes of the next set of chapters that we're going to look at, we're going to be talking about communicating with a muscle cell. And again, we're trying to get to the point where we understand how the depolarization phenomenon occurs in skeletal and then cardiac muscle. So the synapse is that space between axon and the receiving cell. And that space is technically interstitial space, so it's fluid-based. And what ends up happening at the synapse is a neurotransmitter is released from um, the axon's terminal portion, which is the very end of the axon, it's released into the synaptic cleft. So the synaptic cleft is going to be um, that small space between the cells where the neurotransmitters release into interstitial fluid and then goes to a receptor site. 
So the receptor site in our case, and there's many of them, it's not just kind of one property. The receptor sites we're going to be talking about are going to be voltage gated ion channels that are embedded inside of a muscle cell. And they're very similar to what we just talked about. Now, how does this happen? Well, at the end of the axon, the cell has organelles still within it. So we have a Golgi apparatus that's holding some of the neurotransmitters, neurotransmitters being chemicals that are uh, created, and they're inside of the vesicles, just like the Golgi apparatus does in any other cell. It packages into a vesicle, and the vesicles, when they receive the right signal, will send the neurotransmitter to the end of the axon, where the vesicle becomes part of the plasma membrane and dumps the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. So the synapse is the the total space, including axon and receptor uh, cells, the synaptic cleft is the space in between. These are our major neurotransmitters. Now, there's about 30 different compounds that have been identified as neurotransmitters, but we're only going to focus on a key few that are relevant to the paramedic and emergency medicine. These are the names of some of those uh, neurotransmitters, and we'll talk about these neurotransmitters in depth in a few slides as we move ahead. Acetylcholine, Choline being part of that will be a term that we'll have to latch on to to help us with our peripheral nervous system understanding. Ketocholamine is going to, in some ways, be active opposite of acetylcholine. It'll make more sense a little bit later, but ketocholamines are going to include things like norepinephrine, gives rise to epinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. And I, I'm assuming we've all heard of dopamine, something that's very influential in the pain and pleasure response. And serotonin's got actually a few roles. Some of it's part of our um, positive and negative feelings, but part of serotonin's action outside of the nervous system uh, is going to be in, in healing when we have injuries in soft tissue. Endorphins and echephalins we can put close together. Both of those are kind of our morphine-like painkiller neurotransmitters, and they don't just kill pain. They can also help us with things like a reaching pleasure. It gives us the high, essentially, that runners have and the runner's high and other folks that are working out in CrossFit or other types of high endurance training and can also be useful for pleasure releases like we have um, in sexual intercourse. Nitric oxide is relevant to the paramedic because it's a very potent va um, vasodilator. And when we give nitroglycerin, it basically mimics the nitric oxide neurotransmitter. Nitric oxide is also the neurotransmitter that sexual performance enhancing drugs like Viagra are hacking so that they can get the effect of an erection. Let's talk more about these neurotransmitters uh, individually. Acetylcholine is going to be our most abundant neurotransmitter in the body. And we'll learn more about that, why that is, when we get to the peripheral nervous system lecture, the next lecture after the set of lessons. It's involved in the autonomic nervous system. And interestingly enough, you may have some knowledge of it because acetylcholine's classification of mimicking drugs are called cholinergics, and we get that from the last half of acetylcholine. Cholinergics, we generally tie to our parasympathetic ner nervous system in which our feed and breed are the opposite of our sympathetic flight or flight. But it may interest you to know that acetylcholine is actually present in both sympathetic and parasympathetic neurotransmission uh, and peripheral nerves. Nitric oxide, as mentioned, is a profound vasodilator. Um, when someone's taking the sexual performance enhancing drugs, they're essentially releasing nitric oxide. This is also something that might be present in folks that don't have um, sexual performance enhancing need for the drugs. Things that folks take to work out to get that really strong pump through vasodilation are also activating nitric oxide. Our endorphins and enkephalins are basically giving rise to our opioid receptor sites or our internal morphine receptor sites. They can give us that anti-pain or analgesic effect. They can also give rise to anti-depression. Catecholamines are essentially the, in some ways, opposite of our acetylcholines. Catecholamines are going to have a few different drugs that are in the class, and one of them's more that you've heard about is epinephrine. But let's start with dopamine and serotonin. Dopamine and serotonin are both involved in some similar areas, and they actually are neurotransmission outside of the central nervous system. 
when we have dopamine released, our brain is using that as a, a neurotransmitter to reinforce and reward certain behavior. And so behavior or things that we experience that are pleasurable, we certainly want to do again. And if it's not pleasurable, we generally don't want to do again. If we're talking about kind of our normal, very basic um, animalistic part of our brain. In the kidneys, dopamine is going to help with sodium secretion, impacting sodium secretion. And in the vessels, dopamine is going to inhibit norepi's transmission to epinephrine. Serotonin, on the other hand, uh, is involved in the brain in learning, mood, and sleep. So this is gen generally a neurotransmitter that we try to hack when a person's on antidepressants. In the blood vessels, it can cause both dilation and constriction, and this is usually associated, and in small and soft tissue, uh, usually associated with some type of injury. And in the intestine, serotonin is going to increase motility, or the movement of stuff through our GI tract. Norepinephrine also falls under the catecholamine section. Norepinephrine is abundant in the autonomic nervous system as well. Um, often it's going to be thought of, though maybe not properly in some cases, thought of as an opposite to um, acetylcholamine. And it's also important in emotional memory within our brain. So the individual fibers within a nerve are going to be surrounded by connective tissue, one of our types of tissue that we learned early on, and that's called endoneurium. Now, when we're talking about deep versus shallow, we tend to use terms like epi to mean essentially superficial and endo to mean within or deep. So the endoneurium is, endoneurium is going to be the first layer of connective tissue around a bundle of axons. And as we have a bunch of axon bundles together into a group or a fascicle, then we get another layer of fibrous connective tissue to hold all of those together. And then an entire nerve, which is made up of groups of fascicles, then made up of groups of fibers inside each nerve, so lots of axons in that area, become surrounded by connective tissue that's labeled as epineurium. So you can see that actually on the 3D presentation. This is also a picture, though not 3D, of axon that has all those functions we just talked about, surrounded by myelinated sheaths. In this case, it's the Schwann cell. Um, not all myelinated sheaths are Schwann cells, to, by the way, so make sure you've done your reading on differentiating those terms. Then we've got our endoneurium around basically the axon bundle. A fascicle is a number of axon bundles together, and that's surrounded by our perineurium. And then when we have an entire nerve, with multiple fascicles surrounded by perineurium all together with blood vessels and fat surrounding it, then we end up with our epineurium. Also pointed out is we have space for lymph tissue, which is that um, immune system and low pressure drainage system that we haven't talked a lot about just yet uh, in the human body. Okay, so a nerve is basically a bundle of axons that are all communicating likely in a similar area. And some visual terms that we might use, and you're not gonna have to really identify this on slides, it will help to understand what type of cells and tissues we have inside our nervous system tissue. But the only other place you'll see white and gray matter is if the brain has left the human body when we're on calls. Now, if we have glial cells and cell bodies like the soma, which isn't generally ever myelinated, we're going to have gray matter present. If we see white matter, then we're basically looking only at axons and they're myelinated. If an axon is not myelinated, it will still appear gray to the, to the naked eye. So white matter is a bundle of myelinated axons that we can see, and the gray matter is going to be cell bodies, unmyelinated axons, and our glial cell. In this picture here, we can see white and gray matter represented. So Gray matter may not look gray on some of our presentations here. It's what, a, a, a tan color? So remind me, I just said it, play along. The white matter is made up of what? Okay, so myelinated axons, white matter. Gray matter then would be our glial cells and unmyelinated cells, uh, axons, and finally the cell bodies of neurons. Okay, we got a couple of terms here that we're going to use now that we're zooming back out. So we've gone from individual axons at the cellular level, looking at the exchange of chemicals. Then we zoomed out to look at a bundle of axons creating our nerves. Now we're going to talk about 
nerves and move on to greater tissue, okay? So when we're talking about nerve tracks, nerve tracks and impulses are going to follow two directions usually. And our cells don't really move in two directions, meaning when we have an, a neuron, we don't actually have electrical impulses work backwards from the axon terminal, depolarizing back towards the cell body and out the dendrites. That's just not how they work. They're one-way pathways. So it's always going to move from dendrite cell body down the axon. That means that we have to have nerve bundles that go one direction, and that direction might be uh, from the brain to the body. And then we have also one direction neurons going the opposite direction. So that means that the dendrites are away from the brain and they're moving back towards the brain from the body. So we have some terms for this. And both of these terms you want to make sure that you've memorized as equivalents. The first set of terms are our sensory neurons. So sensory neurons are receiving a sensation, they're getting a nerve impulse by measuring an internal body environment or outside of the body environment. Some examples to that could be our very sensitive sense neurons inside our skin where they're receiving things like, and we have different neural structures for all of these, they are sensing pain, they're sensing vibration, they're sensing temperature, all of those signals become a sense. And so that's how we measure our outside environment. And it depolarizes when maybe one of those things is activated, like we've got vibration on the skin. It will send a signal to our brain so that we know that we have vibration on our skin. Just looking at our skin doesn't tell us that we have those types of things occurring. So that's a sensory neuron. Sensory goes from the outside of the brain somewhere in the body towards the brain. Okay, so we're going, uh, I know it's not great English, but bear with me, may help you memorize. Sensories go at the brain, right? They're at, they go at the brain. They go from outside the brain and move towards the brain at the brain. So since that's an A, a they are afferent pathways. Afferent pathways go at the brain, which makes them sensory. Know both of those terms. The opposite, since we have opposite directions, the opposite is going to be going from the brain to the body. And that probably means that the brain is telling our body to do something. And we use the term motor because it's integrating with other neurons, very likely muscle involved. But motor neurons will also communicate with organs that aren't motor neurons, so or muscle neurons rather. So that might be communicating with the liver to do something or communicating with our skin and blood vessels. All those things are receiving signals from the brain, but it moved from inside the brain and spinal column to that organ to do the work. That's a motor neuron, and it's moving away from the brain. Now, at the brain is afferent. Efferent is moving away from the brain and it has an effect on an organ. Motor neurons have effects on, neuro on other organs. And so motor neurons are efferent pathways. There's also one other type of neuron, but it's not actually a, a direction that we're talking about here. We have interneurons in some of our body's structures that allow for us to basically link a sensory directly to a motor neuron. So we receive a signal from the sensory neuron to the spinal cord, and then immediately, instead of going up to the brain and waiting for another signal to come out, it just connects and sends a motor response out. This is part of our reflexes. Reflexes or reflex arcs are connections of neurons. So we have a few different, and certainly you're going to be asked questions about this. So let me tell you an example of a question, perhaps. A question might come along in the sense of what is the simplest type of reflex arc and what is the most complex type of reflex arc? Well, we have basically two types, a two neuron arc and a three neuron arc. The two neuron is the simplest and the three is the most complex. Two neuron arcs are a sensory neuron connected directly to a motor neuron, which will result in a very quick response. We don't have to wait for the brain to make a decision. It just does it. And that's a protective mechanism. The three neuron arc is going to have a sensory neuron going to the spinal cord. And then there's a small neuron that goes between the sensory and the motor neuron called an interneuron, creating a pathway connecting then to the motor neuron. So a reflex might be something like we put our hand over something really hot. As soon as we touch it, that signal goes from where we received the signal, our hand receiving pain, and then it goes to the simple neuron track, maybe a motor neuron, which then tells our body to retract our arm. So in that, 
<clears throat> we create this flexion reflex. So the flexion reflex is going to actually utilize our three neuron pathway and receive a sensory neuron as pictured here. And then you've got this interneuron, which is the, um, not sure that you can see me on this movement, but it's the purple neuron in the center of the spinal cord that's connected to the next soma inside the spinal cord that then goes to our effector muscle. Remember, sensory pathways are affector. They're going at the spinal cord or brain. And our motor neurons are effector. They have an effect and cause a organ to do something. The patellar reflex is also going to utilize a interneuron. And it may surprise you, but paramedics do need to know how to check our reflexes. Where would that come out? I know it seems that it's probably not something we do very often, and that might be true, but we do have to do uh, assessments of reflexes when we're giving patients something that numbs the reflexes. So we can make sure that we don't completely deaden their reflex and hence their muscle re response. That's specifically for administration of magnesium. More on that a little bit later when we talk about how muscles work, but that, that's where it's actually working. But magnesium can deaden our reflexes and, and cause our, our muscles not to work if we give too much of it. And many muscles, not just our skeletal muscles, may be impacted, so it could be a life threat. So when giving magnesium, we have to check reflexes. And patellar reflex is generally one of the most frequently assessed reflexes in which it receives from our reflex hammer or or we'll show you other tools without a reflex hammer, it receives a stimulus of tapping on um, the patellar ligament, which sends a sensory signal or an afferent signal towards the spinal cord. Instead of going to the brain, the interneuron connects the spinal cord and our um, sensory and our motor neuron, our effector neuron, to cause the quadriceps to contract, which then brings our leg uh, in motion. Just revisiting our glial cells. Remember, we have three types of glial cells, and there's two major types of cells in the nervous system, glial and neurons. Neurons are in their own class. They send nerve conductions, and all the other cells are going to be glia or neuroglia. Either term is appropriate. So we have our astrocytes, and those are, as we recall, holding our blood vessels at close within proximity to the um, axons and our cell bodies so that we can have the electrolytes that are in our capillaries make it very short distances to the interstitial environment around the neuron so it can do its thing of polarization, repolarization, and depolarization. The microglia, microglia are our system's immune response directly inside the central nervous system, which means we don't have to wait for cells to make their way out of the capillary and into brain tissue to start fighting infections. Infections in nervous systems are going to cause cells to die, which means we lose some memory, some function, something could have a drastic response if we have an infection occur. So we have a rapid responder, a first responder like we are, to the scene right there inside the central nervous system. And finally, the oligodendrocytes are going to work on maintaining, building, tearing down our myelin sheaths or our um, insulating cells around the axons. Some of the disorders that happen in our nervous system are actually associated with our glial cells not functioning properly. And a really good example of that is multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is a, a, a very difficult disease for patients to manage, and it's something that we may actually have to respond to. Often, we're not responding in the initial phases of their multiple sclerosis. They may have already been diagnosed with it, and we're responding to help them. Now, in the end of multiple sclerosis, what can happen is the nerve impulses can be degraded or not occurring at all. And this is a problem with one of our glial cells not functioning. Here we can see that we've got our normal myelin with an oligodendrocyte maintaining the myelin sheaths, myelin being insulation. So we have normal function, so electricity is going through and we're getting a neurotransmitter released at the axon so that our cells doing whatever it is that that signal needs to do. When we have uh, multiple sclerosis, the cells the person's own cells are attacking their own cells. So the oligodendrocytes are basically malfunctioning and they're breaking down myelinated axons so it strips away that insulation. And remember, that insulation makes it so that there aren't any, there's not a need for 
uh, the the person's axons to have in that myelinated area when it's removed are depolarization structures like our fast voltage gated ion channels and the sodium potassium pumps. So what happens is the electrical impulse stops there. It doesn't move forward. There's an impulse that's sent to this neuron, but it doesn't make its way to, say, the muscle cell. So what happens is we have impairments of depolarization, which then can lead on to where the patient if it's a muscle cell, for example, which is very common, the patient's muscles aren't going to respond and they'll become basically atrophied or stiffened over time because of that degradation. Now, if we have a disorder in which we strip away the ability to send a nerve impulse, then paralysis can result. And when we're talking about muscles, certainly their body is kind of riddled by this. And so they can have some muscles that are destroyed and others that are not. But the scary thing is when it starts to impact the patient's breathing. Given that we use muscle for breathing, both intercostal and our diaphragm, um, if we don't send the nerve signal to take a breath from, say, the phrenic nerve, for example, then we're not able to breathe and the person will now asphyxiate. So we can have some really difficult cases in emergencies with patients with multiple sclerosis. Another disorder of our <clears throat> nerve cells is going to be Parkinson's. And Parkinson's is a, a very troubling disease to have. There's famous people that have uh, Parkinson's. Can you think of any? Well, Michael J. Fox, I think, has uh, Parkinson's disease. And the problem with Parkinson's is this phenomenon um, called the blood-brain barrier. You probably learned about that at the basic level already, but let's expand on it anyways. The blood-brain barrier is um, a, a permeability sense in which the blood vessels are not letting everything go into the brain. Only certain things will make their way into the brain, and those include things like alcohol, anesthetics, and then the very basic things we need for cells to do work are electrolytes and the components of energy, as well as waste leaving the brain. What doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, though, is dopamine. Dopamine is required for a lot of functions in our body, as you remember. And so if a patient is short on dopamine in their brain, and they're not getting the dopamine that's floating around in the body because it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, then we can't just give them dopamine. We don't inject dopamine directly into, say, their um, spinal cord or into their brain to give it. So the treatment for this is to get the patient dopamine in a version of a drug called L-DOPA. L-DOPA is a structured dopamine-like molecule that will cross the blood-brain barrier and then becomes activated as a dopamine-like drug inside the body. Patients with Parkinson's, we think of it a lot of times as older patients, but it can happen in younger adults as well. They'll often be off-center, so they're at a high risk for falling because they have that kind of, their head is slightly forward. It's not necessarily kyphosis, it's just an imbalance in their ability to stand upright. They have rigidity and trembling of their head and their extremities, and it may be so difficult that they can't eat by by using their, their own um, arms to do so. They may rely on other people. Also, when they walk, their motor neurons aren't functioning properly, so they'll have a shuffling gait with very short steps. So it's difficult and likely to cause injury, or they're not taking good care of themselves if they're left alone. So these patients may be patients we see with Parkinson's and then some other disorder, or maybe even trauma associated with it. But it's a good example of the neurotransmitter being necessary and not crossing the blood-brain barrier. Some more disorders specifically of neurons uh, include tumors that are associated with nerve cells. So a neuroma, often when we hear the term that uh, of a cell ending in oma, it often is signaling a tumor. And again, tumors could be benign or malignant, and malignant's the worst type. Benign means it's there, but it's not something that's going to risk the life of the patient. A lot of the neuromas that we see are not actually of the neurons themselves. They're of the glial tissue. So we can have glial gliomas or glial tumors, as well as um, fibrotoma, uh, neurofibromatosis. So we're going to see a picture of this. It's out of your textbook. This is a patient with multiple um, nerve cell, so these may be painful, um, tumors. And you can see this patient's got them riddled throughout their whole body.